Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first legislative district virtual town hall. Tonight, you'll hear from your state legislator, Senator Derek Stanford, Representative Shelley Kloba, and Representative Davina Dewar. At this event, we are take, talking about what has happened so far in the 2022 legislative session. Many of the questions we're hearing tonight were submitted in advance through our survey. And if you're turning in, tuning in now to this live stream, you can also post questions in the comments section and a staff member will get your questions to our legislators. To get started, I'll turn it over to our lawmakers for brief opening remarks. Senator Stanford, can you please start us off? I'm happy to. I am Derek Stanford, State Senator for the 1st District. Um, professionally, I work in data science, uh, and I've been in the legislature since 2011. Uh, I was in the House uh, for nine years and then moved over to the Senate. Um, in the Senate right now, I am the tribal liaison for the Senate Democrats. I uh, do a lot of work with the tribes across our state. Um, my committees are Environment, Energy, and Technology. Uh, I'm also on the, I'm vice chair on the Labor, Commerce, and Tribal Affairs Committee. And I'm also on the Agriculture, Water, Natural Resources, and Parks Committee. Who wants to go next? <laughs> All right. Well, I, maybe I've been here a little bit longer than my <laughs> colleague, Representative Dewar, so I'll go next. So I'm Shelley Kloba, and it's my privilege to represent the 1st District. I have been in this office since uh, 2017, and so this is my sixth session. And I have the privilege of chairing the Commerce and Gaming Committee, and I also serve on capital budget and um, rural development economic development, wait, rural economic, or can, rural development, ag and natural resources. There it is. I knew I could get it out. Um, I have a particular interest in technology. And so autonomous vehicles are something I pay a lot of attention to. And I sit on our autonomous vehicles work group. And I am a um, ex officio on the gambling commission. So glad, glad you're all here with us tonight. Hi, I'm the, I won't say youngest, I'm the newest member <laughs> of the first delegation, Davina Dewar from Bothell, um, and I uh, am an architect by profession, and I'm in currently in my third session in the legislature. Um, I serve as vice chair of the local government committee, vice chair of the environment and energy committee, and I also serve on the transportation committee. I'm an assistant whip and a member of the member of color caucus and i have a particular interest in all things climate change and growth management act related it's nice to see everybody all right with that we'll jump right into the questions uh the first one comes from patrick and uh patrick uh, says he appreciates the 10 million being allocated in the next budget for finishing 522 uh, when can we hope to see full funding to complete the project well, that's a really great question. Um, so uh, as as you've probably heard, um, we have a proposed transportation package um, that's more or less agreed to um, with minor differences between the Senate and the House. And um, there's a particular emphasis on um, active transportation, transit and preservation and maintenance. And so there are, uh, the highway projects that are funded are those that are being backfilled um, because of um, budget shortfalls due to the pandemic. So in the first district, those include the 405 uh, expansion project. Um, and then I'll let my colleagues talk about um, particular items that they've been pursuing. And so there's not a heavy, um, there's not a heavy amount of dollars being spent on um, road projects. And so um, probably uh, the, the proper answer would be in the next transpor transportation project for 522. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think um, this is a little bit um, tangential to the question, because I think when some people think about 522, they think about cars and buses. But I think the things that we use to connect um, various either transit trips or even sometimes with our cars are um, bike and ped paths. And so I think some of you may be familiar with the North Creek Trail. There has been a, a section of it completed recently. And I have a budget proviso that I am asking for, I think $610,000 to help to complete that final connection 
which is very exciting to me because it will connect the trail that is in the north, the interurban trail, with the very long um, Sammamish River Trail slash um, Burke Gilman Trail. And so these are uh, regional connectors. And by you know investing this 610,000 along with um, what the county is adding in, this will really be um, a great project to connect everything together. And I'll jump in to mention a uh, project uh, in Bothell. Uh, between downtown Bothell and Canyon Park, uh, Bothell Everett Highway right now is not, uh, not up to the standard that we need to support transit. Uh, so we do have a project in, uh, in the Move Ahead Washington package that would help with expanding uh, some, of the, uh, some of the lanes there uh, so that we can handle transit on that corridor. Mm -hmm. And that will allow extending the swift green line uh, down from Canyon Park all the way down to downtown Bothell uh, once that project is completed. Uh, so I think that's really significant for uh, all the density that's going in in downtown Bothell, making sure that people can be well connected to transit options. And, also on on the 405 program in general, you know this is really important for our whole region. We know that there are thousands new of new jobs going in in uh, the Bellevue area. Um, we need to be able to handle a lot more demand on that corridor, um, and we know how bad it is now. Uh, we need to really uh, expand our capacity, and that means getting bus rapid transit really set up and moving on that corridor. So uh, I, I think it's just incredibly important that we uh, that we hold on to those uh, projects to, to make that happen. And can I just add that that was actually, a, I think, $450 million shortfall um, that we were able to get funding for in this transportation package, which will help make the add an additional um, express toll lane between uh, 522 and four and uh, 527. And so that overpass on 522 will be redone. Um, so hopefully that will give us the impetus to finish the rest of the 522 project. Great. Um, and just a reminder, everybody out there, uh, you can uh, submit questions through YouTube or Facebook or wherever you're watching us tonight. And uh, also we've got a bunch of questions in the survey and we'll get to, uh, to the next one right now. And it comes from Robert. And uh, Robert uh, says almost all state employee retirement programs offer a cost of living provision, but for plan one teacher and public employees, there is none. Where do you stand on this issue? Well, um, for one, I have been uh, in support of this for quite some time. And it's quite sad to me that we have to continue to battle for these cost of living allowance uh, increases. But in terms of, uh, we had two companion bills. So there was one in the House and one in the Senate, and they're identical. The Senate bill, uh, I have to look up that number, uh, 5676 is sponsored by Senator Conway, and it would give a one-time increase of um, 3%, which would translate into up to $110 per month. Um, while we have asked a lot uh, of patience from the folks who are in the public employee retirement fund and the teachers retirement fund, these, these first ones that we came out with, it's, I still feel it's quite unjust that they don't have these regular um, automatic cost of living increases. And so until we have that, I will keep on um, fighting for this because it's, it's just not okay to, um, have that kind of inequity. Uh, great, our next question comes from Brian. And uh, Brian wants to know why we can't do away with this silly changing of the clocks twice a year. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's the big things like traffic and sometimes it's the little things like changing our clocks. And I don't think uh, any of us on here are uh, like it at all. But uh, the good news, I suppose it's good news and bad news, the good news is um, Representative Marcus Riccelli passed a bill, I think it's two years ago now, that basically makes it so that when the other states change to uh, a single time uh, and not, not, long, not any longer having the daylight savings time, 
then Washington, Washington will automatically. So we are ready to go. Uh, the legislature agrees with you and um, we're just waiting for the rest of folks or for a federal um, uh, activity there. So hopefully we'll get that maybe next year. Great, our next uh, question comes from Nigel. And uh, Nigel says he wants to thank Senator Stanford for introducing Senate Bill 5773, which would have given legislative employees the right to bargain collectively. In the House, the companion bill, House Bill 1806, did not make it to the floor for a vote. Do you support legislative employees' right to organize, and will you commit to work to get this passed in 2023? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I certainly support that. Um, as the prime sponsor on the Senate version of that bill, uh, I can tell you that work is continuing on that. Um, we are disappointed that 1806 did not uh, move out, uh, but, but work does continue this session. Uh, there are some things we can do in the budget uh, to put things in place for that. And, uh, and I, I think, uh, you know, I think we all recognize how much work uh, our, our staff does in the legislature. Um, and this is, this is our assistance, our legislative assistance. It's also uh, caucus staff, nonpartisan staff, uh, all the folks who are working in the legislature to, uh, to make things happen. And, and they deserve a right to, to try to organize if they wish, uh, just like uh, people in the private sector do. And, and just to be clear, that's all this bill does. It doesn't create a union for them. It just authorizes them to, uh, to make that decision for themselves. Uh, so I certainly am going to keep working on that, and I believe we will have uh, some kind of progress on that this session. I'd like to pop in here too. I'm fully in support. You know, a lot of really good bills died um, in the House this year. We had a nine-hour debate on a single bill, and that certainly added to um, the graveyard of really good bills that didn't make it through the House. Um, our staff is incredible. It's probably one of the best staffs in the country. Um, they're dedicated, they're hardworking, they're um, they're just amazing. And um, and they they definitely deserve some protections around um, their their ability to get work done and also not be worked to, into the ground. So I'm looking forward to working more on that next session. And I'll agree with both of the statements that my colleagues have made. I did sign on to that, um, I think it's 1806 was the bill number. And um, it was, one of the things that's challenging about it is that by law, our um, staff are not allowed to lobby, which makes a whole lot of sense for a lot of other reasons. But when it comes to advocating for their own, um, you know, rights and their ability to have a place that honors you know family commitments and mental health and and uh, general health um, we need to do a better job and um, they were in a tough place so i um i would like to see this go next year and so i was glad to hear that uh senator stanford said that there's a little bit of interim work that we can do as well so we'll keep pushing apologize for that my, that was my son calling me i'll have to get back to him later <laughs> and our, our next question comes from kathy and kathy would like to know the status of a house bill 1099 uh, which is climate planning and why did house bill 1782 uh the the missing middle housing bill fail to move Oh boy, um, good news and bad news. Uh, so 1099 actually was voted out of the Senate uh, Local Government Committee this morning. Um, but if how it went this morning is any, any indication, we have a fighter in our hands. There were six amendments in committee, that's not normal. Um, uh, I don't think any Republicans uh, voted for it, nor do we anticipate any supporting it um, going forward. But it is now on its way to Ways and Means um and um we're hoping this year that it doesn't go to the transportation committee because um that portion that uh that sent it to the transportation committee last year which was a, a study by washdot on reducing vehicle miles traveled was already funded last year and so that's not in the bill anymore so there we have high hopes um but i don't 
honestly, I know it's my bill, but I don't actually think there's a more important in environmental climate change bill that we can pass this year because um, it is tied very strongly to the Growth Management Act. It's, it would actually become the 15th element of the Growth Management Act and cities um, in the largest 10 counties um, are having uh, will have to choose from a menu of items on how to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled and those comprehensive plans are starting now so in order to get um, those those um, provisions in place um, for cities to start that planning it needs to pass this year and so any um, any um, support you'd like to lend um, please reach out to uh, people in the um, Ways and Means Committee. And then as far as HB 1782, that went through the local government committee. Um, it's a really, really big bill to try to pass in a, a short session. And um, I worked many, many hours, probably more hours on that bill than any of my own bills um, to try to get that out of local government, the local government committee. Um, I would say there just wasn't a lot of time to work with stakeholders. The cities. Um, were against it, and um, and there were other um, big players that that were against it, and we just didn't have the time to hammer out deals on how to make it um, tenable for them. Um, but I would say, um, in solace, we we can look at the pretty fantastic ADU bill that we got out um, voted off the floor. Um, it's probably the strongest in the nation, and um, it's uh, House Bill 1660 by Representative Shoemaker. But it basically um, gives provisions for ADU um, that, that supersede um, cities uh, ordinances. And so that is a great push to get some middle housing that's really, um, you know, doesn't change the neighborhood character, but it provides an, an easy way for seniors to stay in their homes by either moving into an ADU and renting out the main house or renting out that ADU to help supplement their budget. Um, a way for parents to maybe provide housing for their young adults. There's just really a lot of great things about ADUs that will help add density in a really low impact way. Um, so we're not giving up on middle housing, but it'll have to wait till next year. Yeah, and in, in Rep Dewar's defense, there was on 1782, I just went and I counted up, there were 15 different amendments and two striking amendments that kind of gut the bill and start over essentially. So that that was going to be a very, very long fight. And as we get towards the end of the, the cutoff period where all of the bills, you know, that's that second big hurdle you have to get over, um, there just wasn't time to do it. Oh, I just want, oh sorry, go ahead. I, I see Brenda Vanderloop has a question. Should I answer that? Yeah, I was actually gonna point you in that direction. That'd be great. Okay, great. Um, so it's in way it's going to ways and means um, next. Um, anything that you can, if, if you happen to know any senators on that <laughs> committee, that'd be great. We don't anticipate getting any um, any support from the other side of the aisle, but certainly we we don't ever give up hope. We've done a lot a lot of um, stakeholder work. In fact, even the Association of Washington Businesses is neutral on this bill now. So the only remaining um, Organizations that are against it are the BIAW, which is the Builders Association, um, and the Realtors. Um, everyone else, cities, counties, um, are either pro or neutral. And so just reach out to senators on the Ways and Means Committee. Um, that would be fantastic. Thank you for asking. Great. And our, uh, baby. Next, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a cute baby, by the way. <laughs> I know. So cute. Thank you, Brenda. And uh, so uh, for our next question, we're going to go to Facebook and to Jay. And Jay says that uh, we appreciate the North End 405 improvements needed for bus rapid transit, funding for East Rail and sidewalk and rapid flashing beacon projects in Kirkland and the proposed transportation package. So could you guys talk a little bit more about the, uh, the, the, the proposed tra uh, transportation package of Move Ahead Washington? Um, yeah, we can. I, you know, I think the thing that makes this different um, than past packages is it's historic amounts of investment um, in preservation and maintenance there it's a seven nearly 17 billion dollar package that doesn't raise the gas tax um so i think three billion goes to preservation and maintenance um which doesn't sound like a lot but that's a historic proportion relative to the entire package um it's funding ferry electrification um and then again a, a historic investment in transit and active transportation that, that we've never seen before. Um, 
And a lot of that's funded with the Climate Commitment Act. Um, and and the, the idea is obviously to bring down greenhouse gas emissions and, um, and fund such, such things as um, 18 and younger um, having free uh, free ridership on transit. Um, I, I can leave some other details for my uh, seatmates to discuss. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in too. Um, I, I also saw another question go by about specifically about the Canyon Park uh, on ramp off ramp area. Um, so part of the 405 projects, uh, part of the point of that is, uh, as I mentioned before, getting bus rapid transit service uh, along the 405 corridor. Um, that uh, that particular interchange is going to be uh, getting some significant upgrades uh, as we get direct access ramps built uh, from the park and ride so that buses will be able to go directly from the park and ride into the express lanes. Um, and, and also they'll be able to come directly off the freeway from the express lanes directly off uh, to, uh, to have stops and, and pick up people. Um, so, so that will be, uh, that will be getting some attention in the package. And I think the other thing I forgot to mention was a, a significant amount of money to go towards, um, safe streets and sidewalks. So, um, you know, safe routes to schools, grants that help local governments fund active transportation projects, um, which we'll all see locally. Um, and also, I think it's a good moment to mention that, you know, we're able to do all of this without, uh, without having a new increase in the gas tax. Part of the reason we can do that is because of, you may have heard that there's some budget surplus. So we are using uh, some transfers from the operating budget uh, in order to accomplish some of this. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's where some of that money is going. And also, as was mentioned before, uh, some federal dollars that are, are helping out quite significantly here. So, uh, so you, you may have heard about surplus money um, and this is where some of it's going. Yeah, and then I, I have a bill on also Senator Kuderer to have deferred sales tax maintenance or uh, deferred sales tax to help fund that funding gap for 405. So there, it, we've kind of patched together um, but I, it, uh, I've worked a lot on 405 with um, Representative um, Slatter on the Transportation Committee. So I, I, I just have to mention her because um, she's just been my partner in crime the whole way through. We did not think we were going to um, actually be successful, but we gave it our all. And thank God uh, so far it's worked out. Great. And our next question is uh, from Steve. And uh, Steve asks, uh, what have you personally done to reduce the budget? And what things have you proposed to reduce the state budget uh, to, uh, to, to make it more balanced? Well, I think one of the things that's important to note that unlike the federal budget, um, our Washington state budget is required to be balanced. So that is um, part of what occupies us, uh, you know, especially in the last week making sure that we do have balance between our um, expenditures and our revenues. Um, I think some of what we've done in this last year are things like um, putting money into people's pockets. Um, unemployment insurance um, was certainly a lifeline for a lot of people, despite um, the difficulties that many had with accessing it because of just the absolute avalanche of uh, new cases, as well as, of course, we had some cyber issues. But in addition to that, we, we did um, some uh, tax cuts for the employers in terms of the unemployment tax that they pay. So that was like $2.2 .2 billion. Um, we also did another, um, a second round of like $214 million worth of um, unemployment tax relief that was targeted specifically at small businesses. So there's there's a variety of ways that we have tried to um, help put money back into people's pockets because when they do have money to spend, it's they're spending it on food and medicine and clothing and things that are oftentimes purchased right here locally in our community. And so that helps to um, recharge the community um, economic situation as well. 
And I think I think this is a great question to think about from kind of a, a higher level as well. You know, we want to live in a state where we have a strong social safety net. Uh, we want to have programs that help folks uh, when they're uh, hitting tough times. And so one of the best things we can do to help the state budget is uh, to take steps to make sure people don't fall into poverty. Um, you know, we've we have tried over the past several years uh, to improve um, aspects of our bankruptcy system uh, so that folks can recover and uh, and get back on their feet financially. We've taken steps certainly through the pandemic, uh, as uh, Representative Kloba mentioned, um, to focus on unemployment uh, and helping out people who were, you know, hitting a, a rough patch financially because of the pandemic. Um, there's a lot of things that can happen to people that's just completely beyond their control. And if we can make sure they get back on their feet instead of collapsing into a financial spiral, um, then that means they're they're able to get out there and be uh, working and and healthy, uh, and and that helps our state budget. Um, so if we want to have a strong state budget, we just have to be really effective at uh, making sure people are not falling into poverty. If we can build a strong middle class, that is what really moves our state forward. Uh, and so I I think that's a really important part of what we do. Yeah, we've done a lot of investments in college and career readiness and, um, you know, making, helping people move out of poverty and become middle, middle class and um, really reach their potential, um, reaps rewards year after year versus um, not making those investments and then people barely getting by. Um, so I think while it may not be the answer you're looking for, I think uh, the approach is more investment for future revenues. Um, next, we'll go to uh, Mary, who also has a budget related question. Uh, Mary asks, uh, what is your plan for tackling our state's lack of an income tax, which overly burdens the sales tax? And why don't we have a public bank yet? <laughs> well, I can take the first part of that. Um, I think one of the things we hear quite often is the inadequacy, the unfairness of our tax system. And so starting in the 2017 session, we passed a bill that created the tax structure work group. And so they have had various stages in their work process. And most recently in 2021, did a series of town halls where they were presenting um, some information about what our current tax code looks like and what some potential ideas are for changing that tax code and then getting feedback from people about this. And so if you're one of the people who is kind of tuned in and you went to the meetings, that's wonderful. But there are also opportunities to um, attend those virtual meetings, I guess, historically. We've archived um, some of those meetings. And so um, uh, it's, let's see, what is the um, website? It's taxstructure.org. And so when you go there, there's a ton of resources and you can look at all the work that's been done so far, but it really focuses on um, a couple of aspects. So one, the goal is to create a tax system that is adequate, fair, um, very stable, and transparent so that it's easy for people to understand what's coming in and where is it being spent. So um, the, again, I said the current information was kind of about the advantages and disadvantages of our current system. And um, what, I think this is the next real step. What are the recommendations that this work group is going to formulate so that we have um, a, a better tax uh, structure and it, it shows improvements for individuals, for families, for businesses. Um, one of, for an example, one of the uh, things they're looking at is what could be an alternative to the business and occupations tax. I think that's fairly. Um, I think a lot of people could agree 
that that's not a great tax and it doesn't do what we need it to. And so that's one that they're really taking a look at. So I encourage you to go to that taxstructure.org and take a look around and there will be, um, it'll help you understand some opportunities for feedback as well. And great. I'll put in on the, uh, on the state bank part of, or public bank part of that question. Um, we did pass uh, Senate Joint Memorial 8006 uh, recently, which uh, this is regarding uh, at the federal level, uh, a national infrastructure bank. Um, so that that's one way to go at it. Uh, the effort to create a state public bank uh, is continuing and, uh, and has kind of evolved over time. Uh, we do have programs that are kind of revolving loan funds uh, that I think are a good uh, a, a good blueprint for how we could approach that. And I know Senator Hasegawa has done a lot of work around that. I support moving forward with it, uh, but uh, obviously that hasn't gained uh, enough support to, to move forward yet. Um, but I think there is opportunity there uh, to make sure that we're able to provide help to local governments, to cities and counties uh, for their infrastructure needs. Great. Up next, we'll go to uh, Jane. And Jane has a question about homelessness. Uh, she says that uh, homelessness is a statewide issue. Uh, when will state government take the lead on dealing with it? So uh, there's uh, there's many ways that we uh, try to deal with homelessness. Um, the, the Housing Trust Fund is probably the most obvious. Uh, we've had significant investments uh, you know, historic levels of investment in the housing trust fund uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, and that's money that goes to develop housing that uh, will be accessible to uh, folks with low income and also um, supportive services, uh, wraparound services with the housing. So people who are dealing with um, substance abuse issues uh, or, or things like that can get the services they need and be housed. And, uh, and that's, I mean, we know from uh, experience here and in other states that that's really the best way to move forward. Uh, you, you have to get people housed so they can stabilize. Um, that's the housing first approach. Get them housed so they can stabilize, provide the services they need. Um, and, you know, people are very different. They come from, you know, a lot of different places uh, and circumstances. Um, so there are very different kinds of services that are needed, um, but that's something that we can do and that we're trying to expand as quickly as we can. Yeah, there are a couple of really great bills that passed out of the House that I'll refer you to so you can track them. Um, one is um, 1860 by Representative Davis, and it's preventing homeless um, among persons discharged from behavioral health care um, facilities. And the second is HB 1866 by um, Representative Chop, and it's supportive housing. So over 70% of people who are chronically homeless struggle with a health condition. Um, stable housing is um, what's needed for them to have their health uh, care treatment done in person um, and to prevent the chronic homelessness. So the idea is you do housing first, because once you house someone, then you have access to them to give them the support that they need to be to get healthy and be able to become um, productive again. And just to tag one more thing on that, I think Rep Dewar kind of um, alluded to it. Um, I One of the most moving um, uh, experiences on the floor this session was when we passed a bill. Um, it was sponsored by Representative Frank Chop, right? Yeah. You know the one. It was 1866, and it's called Apple Health and Home. And it builds on the idea that there are many people who are homeless, and it's largely to do with either an untreated mental health issue or substance use disorder or um, an intellectual disability or a, a developmental disability. These are things that need to be treated in our healthcare system. And of course, on the street, that's a very difficult thing to get. So um, we're using this bill, as I understand it, allows us to coordinate the Apple Health Program, which is our Medicaid, with housing, almost like a, having a prescription for housing. 
because we can do all the healthcare in the world, but if the person isn't stably housed under, um, you know, a, a solid roof, it, it's just, it's, it's like pouring it into a bag with a hole. And so um, I, I can recall one of the stories Representative Macri said, and uh, she is a person who I admire greatly. She does, her whole career has been about um, helping homeless people find homes. And she said that uh, they moved someone into a permanent home. And his comment was, I have my own bathroom. And it was just something that we all take for granted as something that is just ordinary. And just the ability to restore somebody's dignity by giving them that opportunity to have their own bathroom. Um, when you combine that with healthcare, I think we can really make a difference in a lot of people's lives. Up next, we'll go to uh, Michael, who has a question about uh, taxes. He asks if there's any sort of tax relief for seniors plan. It seems to me that Representative Orcutt did a property tax cut for seniors. There's an exemption, and I think last year or the year before, we increased the amount of money that you can make and still qualify for that exemption. Um, that's the one, the biggest one I'm thinking of. Yeah, I'm remembering that same that same one, but I think it was a couple of sessions ago. Um, I'm picturing us all on the floor, so that tells us it was, <laughs> it was definitely in real person. <laughs> yeah. I think there's been a, a couple over the past few sessions um, focusing specifically on property taxes uh, because that is something that uh, retired folks who are on a fixed income uh, struggle with that. And uh, and so, so that's been a, a particular focus. Um, and, uh, and beyond that, uh, I'm trying to think of anything else that would be directly related. I, I think that focus really for, for seniors has been really on property tax in, in particular, since that's such a, such a common issue, uh, that seniors are facing. Yeah, and if I, I think can that... put in a plug for our um, Snohomish County assessor, I've worked with her. I've um, brought her out to like a manufactured home uh, community to uh, really get folks connected with the assessor's office where these um, discounts and exemptions uh, come from. And they are very willing to sit down and talk with you if your current income and the way you have your investments or whatever structured doesn't work now, they can even give you some helpful hints about how you might um, take your 401k distributions in a different way or in a different time frame or something so that you can um, manage your income in a way that um, helps you um, qualify for these. So I would I would very much encourage you to reach out to the Snohomish County Assessor's Office if you're one of our residents who lives in Snohomish County. Well, and I think on the local level, you know, we have funding from the uh, federal government to help with things like utility um, fees and, and whatnot. So uh, if, if you're having a particular issue, reach out to your um, local city and they could probably help you with um, arrears or just going forward helping um, with your utilities. Um, so that's another uh, avenue to pursue. Um, we have also had uh, some bills over the past couple of years uh, addressing specifically folks living in mobile home parks mm -hmm. um, because you know, often uh, these are folks who are on fixed income. And if there's a change in that mobile home park, a change in ownership, or the owner wants to sell it, uh, that can be really financially devastating for those folks. And so we're trying to make sure that there's some protections in place and some assistance if they do need to move. Uh, so we've been we've been trying to address those issues. Senator Stanford, you're breaking my heart. That was my bill. And it's <laughs> one of the ones in the graveyard this year. <laughs> Well, still, still, working it. It. <laughs> still working on it. Still working on it. Still working on it. Yeah. 
only the third year. <laughs> Four is going to be the charm. <laughs> I know you're not a person who gives up. <laughs> no. All right. And up next, we'll go to Erin. And Erin has a, a question about uh, working folks. And she says that the pandemic has made on the job conditions really tough for a lot of workers. Uh, what are you all doing to help working people? Well, we spent nine hours on the floor <laughs> on a bill. Uh, what was it called? Muscular skeletal, Muscular, uh, skeletal uh, injuries. injuries. Um, so about 40% of L and I claims are around a repetitive motion. Um, and this, this bill, um, seek, it seeks to, um, prevent repetitive motion, um, injuries. And, um, we did, we spent, I think there were maybe 15 amendments and on final passage, every single person from the other side spoke their three minutes. So it was literally a, a nine hour debate on whether or not we could try to um, prevent repetitive motion injuries, um, which would save taxpayers a lot of money in LNI claims. Um, so that's, that's one that is uh, at the top of my head. Um, I think there are others. Uh, maybe my seatmates can remember some of the other ones we've worked on. Yeah, so there there have been quite a few um, specifically prompted by the pandemic about uh, making sure workers can stay safer on the job. Uh, you know, when the pandemic began, there were workers who wanted to wear masks and were prohibited from doing that by their employers. Um, so we took steps to make sure that workers could stay safe uh, and also uh, helped with uh, providing a lot of that uh, protective equipment um, and also making changes to uh, to LNI to make sure that workers who are injured on the job uh, can get the treatment that they need and that includes people who uh, contract COVID uh, through the workplace and that can be really difficult to assess where did you catch this disease? So that's why we have something called uh, presumptive uh, illness, where the presumption is if you're in certain occupations that if you get, get this disease, we presume that you uh, contracted it uh, from your workplace. Um, and so that was really important for uh, healthcare workers in particular. Um, so we've taken a lot of steps like that uh, that will make us a little bit more prepared for any future health emergencies uh, and and more generally trying to improve the efficiency of our workers' compensation system so that patients can get the help they need with fewer hoops to jump through. Uh, and I've had bills around trying to streamline uh, independent medical exam procedures so that patients don't have to go to as many appointments uh, to, to verify their claims. Uh, so there's a lot of work to do there. These are complicated systems, but uh, we're constantly working to try to make them more accessible uh, so workers can get the help they need when they need it. Um, there was one other bill that we did pass off the floor, which was to deal with the nurse shortage. So right now, um, healthcare professionals, as everyone knows, are, are taxed. Um, they've just been under the gun for two years working so hard and, and um, often at the detriment of their mental health. And so they're leaving the profession. And um, so this, this bill voted off the House floor um, would require a certain number of nur uh, nurses per patient. Um, and so uh, just to try to give them some relief so they're not being asked to provide more than they're capable of in terms of care. And also, I mean, that's to the patient's benefit as well, right? We don't want, we know that as, as the number of patients a nurse is taking care of increases, um, your outcomes as a patient um, are, not, are not as positive, so. And I think in addition to that, because it's a little, and, and this is, I know we're kind of speaking specifically about the healthcare uh, industry in terms of working conditions, but one of the things that um, was very clear from our discussion on the floor um, with that um, staffing ratio bill was that um, nurses not only need an appropriate, safe um, workplace, in terms of the the um, the workload that they're having, they also need 
um, the loans, the workforce development kinds of things so that we are filling the pipeline of nurses that want to go into the hospitals. And so there are some um, uh, representative Slatter, Vandana Slatter in the 48th passed, um, had a bill on um, some nurse educator loans. And so um, making it easier for more people to get the education to become a nurse. Um, part of it is, you know, it's a little bit of a circular argument. You need nurses so that you can have the staffing so that more nurses will want to go into the profession because the, the workplace is um, supports their professionalism. Yeah, and that um, that nursing bill that I mentioned is um, 1868, if anyone wants to, to look that up for specifics. It also deals with breaks and meals and that sort of thing, too. And I just want to remind everybody real quick that uh, if you're if you're watching, you can post a question uh, through any of the any of the platforms you're watching on. So if there's a topic that hasn't been covered yet tonight, please, uh, please feel free to ask. And uh, next we'll go to Madeline. Uh, Madeline uh, would like to know about climate change and uh, what you all are doing to protect ecosystems and natural beauty from destruction. Oh, gosh. Well, um, I do. I work a lot in the climate change arena, um, and I know Senator Sanford's also on that committee, so I won't, I won't hog all the time. But um, a lot of what we do is I have another bill. So I not only do I have the climate change um, element bill, but I have one um, that requires landfill um methane capture um, land methane is uh, an extremely powerful greenhouse gas um, which traps um, somewhere in the magnitude of like 80 to 90 percent um, more uh, heat than um, co2 um, and but it only lasts in the atmosphere for 10 years so uh, an intergovernmental panel panel on climate change came out with a report last summer right before the heat dome um, and that panel um, is from the un and they they said that our only um, our only real avenue to prevent um, the passing the 1.5 degrees Celsius warming threshold is to uh, mitigate um, methane by 45%. And so that bill, 1663, um, is in the Senate right now. And um, obviously that, that impacts uh, natural resources and, and um, the air, the very air that we breathe. And um, so that, that would be a big one. Um, I don't want to talk the whole time. I'll let Senator Stanford talk about what, what's going on in the Senate. Um, so there's, I mean, there's so many ways that we are, are trying to address uh, both climate change and protecting ecosystems. Um, you know, there's been a lot of focus lately around uh, salmon habitat. And, and that's about more than just uh, you know, specific projects in specific places. It's it's really about systemic change because um, climate change affects uh, the salmon and affects uh, that habitat quite significantly. I mean, it's about when the rain comes, how much of it there is, um, what the temperatures are in the streams. Uh, and so there's there's no one single thing to do. There's, there's really just a whole host of things that you have to do to address these issues. Um, so we have projects, uh, a lot of projects actually in the Senate capital budget uh, addressing clean water. Um, that's obviously important for people as well as uh, salmon. Um, and, and, and also, you know, we've seen more significant uh, flooding events lately. Um, and we know that we're essentially in the midst of a, a prolonged drought uh, on the West Coast. Um, so these things are, are having huge impacts uh, across our state on, uh, on people, on fish, on agriculture. Um, we have better approaches now than we did decades ago. Uh, and one project or one program that I want to emphasize is called Floodplains by Design. And the idea there is that instead of trying to tightly control uh, how water flows, we have floodplains by design where there are areas where we let uh, more natural processes take over um, and, and do that in a way that it's not going to threaten housing or anything like that, but have designated floodplain areas where we expect um, more of that sort of activity to happen naturally. And that improves water quality. Uh, it, it provides buffers for absorbing high, high flood events. 
um, it's a, a more effective way of approaching some of these problems. So our approaches have gotten more effective over the years. We're using uh, the best science to to try to direct how we how we tackle these things. Um, but it is still a huge issue. Uh, and I mean, fish culverts, you may have heard uh, a lot of talk around that. Um, that's a big part of this as well, um, making sure that fish can actually get upstream and past some of the blockages that we've had uh, that have gone in over the years. Um, so, so protecting uh, and preserving um, the natural beauty is, is all part and parcel of responding to climate change and, uh, and making sure that we're protecting our, our water supplies as well. Can I circle back and connect a couple dots? Um, uh, someone had asked earlier about 1099 and, and 1782, and, and what I what I um, often feel that people are missing is the idea of sprawl and how sprawl contributes to the devastation of our natural environment. Um, we know as cities that single-family housing um, does not pay for itself. So the amount of taxes that you pay if you're in a single-family house does not pay for the services that you actually receive from a city government. And um, if you care about climate change, if you care about the natural environment, you should be supportive of housing um, that's more dense, frankly, because that's um, it's cheaper. It's cheaper um, and your taxes are, are going to be lower if you support housing that's um, that's supporting transit. You need a certain amount of density to support transit um, and sprawl. If, if we're going to do sprawl, then what you're doing is you're increasing the amount of road miles, you're increasing the amount of pollution from from driving, you're increasing um, stormwater, all of those things. Um, and what you're doing is you're, you're pushing growth out to where there's farmland and forest and natural um, natural resources and natural lands. And so um, people uh, sometimes don't make that connection. But there's a very, very direct connection between housing and how dense we live and um, preserving the natural environment. And so that's something that I think people need to really think about um, uh, when they say that they're environmentalists. All right, we've got about seven minutes left. So next we'll go to Jackie. Uh, Jackie asks, uh, what happened to the regulations on selling marijuana? Uh, she says she sees all kinds of gummies and things being sold at gas stations. Oh, that uh, You're is- on. <laughs> I, I'm glad you said seven minutes. I'm going to try to keep this tight so I don't hug up all the air. I have a bill. Uh, it's called, it's 1668. It died, but we've figured out a way to put life back into it. The situation, in case folks aren't sure what um, uh, Jackie is referring to, has come about because of the legalization of hemp. So hemp and cannabis are very similar plants. The main distinction is the amount of THC in the plant. And that is, if you can remember, the, the sort of psychoactive or, or intoxicating part of the plant. CBD is uh, very, uh, uh, hemp has a lot of CBD in it. And hemp can be grown for fiber, for oils, for um, seed, for food. There's a lot of things you can do, um, biofuels, et cetera. But one of the things that hemp growers have figured out that they can do is to grow the hemp, uh, extract all of the CBD, and then break it down chemically, mechanically, et cetera, and repackage it as THC, as uh, what you might find in the drugs or in the, the gas station or what have you is um, something called Delta-8 THC. Our laws, both here and, and the federal uh, uh, government, define that THC content by Delta-9 THC. So it's a specific way that the molecules fit together. And Delta-8 is just slightly different. It's different enough that people, uh, these hemp growers, felt like it wasn't regulated, thus not illegal. But your body uh, still has that same intoxicating effect that happens when you consume any form of THC. So you're seeing um, a huge loophole that my bill seeks to close. We also are uh, in the bill, we add a fee 
to the licenses for a lot of those uh, you know, drug stores, quick, or sorry, quickie marts, um, tobacco stores, vape shops, who are doing some of the selling of this, this type of product, um, we attach a small fee to their license to um, fund the enforcement. So part, and I should back up also, part of the reason why that stuff is outside of the legal 502 cannabis market is because our liquor and cannabis board only has jurisdiction over the licensees that are inside the uh, legal 502 system. They have no jurisdiction outside. And so this bill gives them the opportunity to do that. It's really important. It is my top priority. And um, I don't like that stuff being out there any better than you do. So we're going to we're going to take care of it. All right, great. Well, that is all the time we have for today. So just a reminder to everybody out there, if you didn't get your questions asked, we're going to put the lawmakers email addresses up on the screen. So so please, if you didn't get your question answered tonight, send an email and uh, we'll get to you. Um, so I'm just going to turn over back to the lawmakers for some uh, closing remarks real quick. Uh, Senator Stanford, I'd like to start with you. Sure. So just very quickly, I want to mention two bills that I am continuing to work on. Uh, first, the um, 1806, uh, 5773, the staff organizing bill. Uh, that's one that I'm continuing to work on. And I just want bill proponents to know that uh, we do have some opportunity to keep moving forward there this session. And if we don't get there this session, that's something I'll be working on over the interim to make sure it happens next session. And also a bill on bankruptcy. Uh, we need to improve our bankruptcy protections in this state. Uh, and that's something that I think we need to come back to, especially because so many folks are struggling financially because of the pandemic right now. Uh, we've taken some good steps over the past few years uh, to improve that. Uh, especially protection of people's homes, uh, but we need to do more. So I will be working on that over the interim and preparing for that next session as well. Uh, and uh, and I just wanna say thanks to everyone for uh, for tuning in and, and listening to us. Thank you. Well, I'll go next. I, I kind of wish that we were all in person in a big hall and we could um, do things like, I'd love to, have you raise your hand if you have any concerns about autonomous vehicles um, testing in Washington. I think that there, when there's a safety driver, um, it's really exciting that they're testing here because um, these cars in the future have such a great potential for um, leveling the transportation playing field, particularly for folks who don't drive or can't drive, uh, have a disability, um, for whatever the reason is, I think they can potentially be a great equalizer. Um, they need to learn how to drive in hills, mountain passes, rain, fog, um, all of the great conditions that we have here in Washington that can be used to train those cars. But driving, testing them without a human person in the car, for me, it feels like we need a little bit of a higher standard. And uh, one of the bills I worked on the session that died um, would have sought to create those higher standards. So um, if people are not uh, comfortable with cars with no driver in them at all, being tested, you probably should reach out to me because I'd like to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, I feel like I talked a lot about um, the, the bills that I'm working on, I'll, but I'll mention a couple more that are still alive um, and whoever asked the tax question might be interested. So I have two other bills that change the um, the update cycle for the growth uh, comprehensive plans for cities um, from eight to 10 years. So it gives them a little bit of extra time, but it also includes some accountability that's not there now. So if if um, their comp plan is enacted, but they haven't actually passed the development regulations to follow through on that comp plan, they're at the five year update, then um, they are then required um, to check in every year until they follow through. Um, and then another bill, 1978, does the same with shorelines management. To, to align with that 10-year um, update. And then one final bill, which is unbelievably the most controversial bill I think I'm running is uh, to get rid of community councils. 
there are two community councils in Kirkland and in Bellevue that um, have been in place for 50 years. They were, they were enacted um, to, I guess, ease the pain of annexation and they still exist. Unfortunately, those, those community councils have veto power uh, over their city councils and that causes a lot of angst in terms of having to move um, up zoning um, required in the city to meet their growth targets into other areas of the city. A lot of legal fees um, for them to um, navigate those waters and so that bill has made it out of the house and hopefully will be passed in the senate and will give kirkland and bellevue a break um, from just a really arduous task of having to do land use planning around those community councils so um with that i i guess i'll close it out just by thanking everyone for being here and for making it um the questions, you know, they were great. Gave us an opportunity to let you know what we're doing, and um, uh, and it went by super fast. You know? Well, and we really, really appreciate our ASL interpreters, yes. Chris and Sarah. Thank you so much. Yeah, and all of the staff that helped um, set this up for us. Thank you very much. Yes. There's a lot of behind the scenes people making it all work. And so we appreciate that. Great. Well, thank, you everybody. thank you everybody for joining us tonight. And again, if uh, your question didn't get answered tonight, uh, please stick around and uh, send an email uh, at the conclusion. Thank you all.